Hi, so if you're here, this video is really dependent on the previous one. So if you just watched that and you, you took a break and talked to your plant, <laughs> then well, welcome back. Um, and um, here I'm going to continue the discussion of convolutional neural networks, uh, building off of what I did before with the filtering function and take the next step into max pooling. So I'll, I don't want to keep talking about it because that's exactly what the video is going to talk about. Um, and I'll see you in the future because there'll be even more of these after this one, okay? See you soon. Now that I've wrapped up talking about the convolutions, uh, there's one other, there's many other aspects to this diagram, but there's one other really important operation that happens in a convolutional neural network that's described in this diagram as subsampling that I want to add to my diagram and my code demonstration. And that is, and I'm not going to call it subsampling. I, um, the, the common term for this now is called pooling. Um, and in particular, the operation that I want to add is max pooling. So there are different kinds of pooling you could do, but max pooling is the standard pooling operation for a convolutional neural network. So max pooling, I mean, it's another layer. It can happen at any given point. Um, so we could max pool before we apply the convolution. But I, typically speaking, the convolutional filters are applied. And then after those are applied, we get new images out of those. And those go through a max pooling layer. So I think to describe, I think I need to erase this whole diagram so that I can look at max pooling. And then we could kind of come back to this uh, when we look at the full architecture. So. Let's begin with our 28 by 28 image. Then let's assume I have one filter, just to simplify things. I had one filter that was 3 by 3. And one thing I didn't discuss, and it's going to be more relevant with the max pooling layer, because I'm going to do something specific with it, is there's a term you'll see called stride. And stride refers to, remember, this filter, you know, I'm not going to actually do this 28 by 28. <laughs> But this filter is applied to each and every pixel. We take, we take this filter, apply it to this pixel, and this gives us a new image. Pixel, apply filter, take the result into a new pixel. Pixel, apply filter, take the result, put it into the new pixel. Here's the thing. This is 28 by 28. This is a 3 by 3 filter. I had to start with this pixel right here, right? Because the edges don't have neighbors on all sides. So ultimately, this and, and stride, sorry, stride refers to how far I pass the filter along as I'm going through the image. Um, I don't really have enough spots here. But you know, I could, I could take the filter and jump over pixels as I'm applying it to reduce the resolution of the image. In this case, I had a stride of one. In my code that I wrote, the stride was one. I just slid over by one. And we can actually see where the stride would go. This ultimately right there, the x plus plus, y plus plus, that's the stride. So I could say x plus equals stride, y plus equals stride, and set the stride equal to one. So that's what was happening here. But even with a stride of one, if I'm skipping the edge pixels, my new image is 27 by 27. So one thing that's really key to how a convolutional neural network works is that the image over time, as it goes from layer to layer to layer, so this is the uh, convolutional layer with the filters. And now I'm going to talk about the pooling layer. Um, the, the resolution is reduced. And this has a number of benefits. One is images are high resolution with millions of pixels. So this, the, this learning space of a neural network to learn all of the parameters of every pixel connected to every filter throughout multiple layers, it would just be much too big to realistically be computationally realistic to do. So this process of reducing the image down and down and down as the layers is effective in keeping things manageable. But it also has another benefit, which is we're trying to boil the essence of the image down into something that will highlight key features in that image. And so this is really what, the, what pooling does, what max pooling does. Um, one, one thing it does is it really reduces the resolution, which I'll show you in a second. But it also picks and chooses the pixels that have the highest values to emphasize those, what is really being activated. 
So um, pooling comes with a matrix as well. It's not really a filter, but it's a matrix. And uh, a standard uh, matrix might be two by two. And so let's take the case, and actually let me erase all this, just to zero in on pooling. To describe this, I'm going to start with an eight by eight image. And I'm going to do max pooling with a two, two by two max pooling with a stride of two. So there are no weights. This is not a filter. It's two by two is just describing how much of the, how many pixels am I looking at at one given time. If I'm looking at a two by two area of pixels for each iteration of this algorithm, and then my stride is two, the next set of pixels I'll look at is here, the next one is here, the next one is here. So for, uh, for, the, for the columns, I end up looking at four, and for the rows, it's the same. It's eight by eight, four. So actually, the result after max pooling is four by four. Four by four. Now, how does the algorithm work? Well, this sounds like some fancy thing. This is actually the simplest thing ever. Basically, for each one of these areas of two by two pixels, take the largest value, the brightest color, and put it in there. So I'm going to fill in some arbitrary values here. So I'm not going to fill this whole thing out, but you see, I don't know how well you can see this, but I have the numbers 4, 8, negative 1, 2. The highest one is 8. It goes here. I have the numbers 3, 3, 1, 9. The highest one is 9. The highest one is 1. The highest one is 10. And so the max pooling algorithm takes these little neighborhoods, 2 by 2 max pooling, skips, goes from one to the other with a stride of 2. I could have just moved these neighborhoods just by one or by even a larger amount. Um, but this is pretty typical. This has the benefit of subsampling the image, reducing it, but not just, we could do average pooling. So you could do average pooling, average all of these, but it turns out convolutional neural networks perform better with max pooling over average pooling. Maybe not in all cases, but in sort of like the standard image classification case. And this is because what we're looking for are features in the image that we want to highlight. And so by uh, looking at an area of pixels and seeing which pixel sort of activated the most and keeping that one, that's going to really emphasize and help boil the essence of the image down into something lower resolution. I should add, just to be really accurate here, and the chat is, uh, tell, is, is offering some different opinions about this, that while max pooling is the most common historical example of pooling in a convolutional neural network, there are other, other research is showing promising results from things like dilated pooling, which is a new concept to me that I just looked up and read about. Some combination, you can also do a combination of max pooling and average pooling. So there is, I think, some discussion and research happening there. And I'm not here to tell you what is the optimal way to architect your convolutional neural network. I just want to talk about and explain the process and look at an example of it, which is very common, like max pooling. So I'm going to write another function, much like convolution, but call it pooling. Same thing happens here. I want to receive an image. I want to give an x, y. I want to return some RGB value that is the highest RGB values within that neighborhood. Now, there's an interesting question here. Do I take the RGB values from the brightest pixel, whatever they might be, or do I just take the, the highest R, the highest G, and the highest B independently, and they could be from different pixels? I don't, I don't know the answer to that right now. Let me just go with actually picking the brightest R, the brightest G, and the brightest B separately, independently. So I'm going to start with the brightest R, G, and B. And I, I could start with zero, but just to be really, really safe, absolutely in the convolutional process, there's the, the, the idea of pixels is gone. We're really just dealing with numeric data. Um, so I really should, if I'm going to try to find the brightest, a start with in negative infinity, because that's the lowest possible number, you know, in JavaScript, that is. Then I want to look at this 2 by 2 area. And the same thing that I did before in the convolution, I want to look at the given pixel and its neighbors. And then I could get the R, G, and B from that pixel. And now I just want the maximum. I want if this R is greater than that pre the, what is being stored as the brightest R, then that R should be the brightest R, which I can do with the max operation. Bright R is the biggest between bright R and R. And the same for G and B. Oh. 
<laughs> and that has to be one and two. This is actually all that I need to do. This is max pooling right here, but now I just need to return bright R, bright G, and bright B. Next, I'm going to create yet another image. I'm going to call it pooled. And pooled is also a blank image. However, if you recall, I'm going to use a stride of two. So the resolution of that image is reduced further by half. So I'm actually going to take out the stride from here. And I'm going to create a global variable for stride. But this stride is only referring to the pooling process. Because then I can say create image dim divided by stride, dimensions divided by stride. Just to add some comments for a moment, this is convolutional layer. I mean, I'm simulating the idea of a convolutional layer. I'm not actually, there's no neural network here. There's no machine learning here. I'm just going through these particular algorithms without matrix operations, I should add. Then, let's add the pooling operation. So same thing here. I'm going to go through all of the pixels. In this case, I can start at 0 but I still need to only go to dimensions minus one because basically I'm going to skip every two pixels and I don't want to end up here. So this is plus equal stride and this is plus equal stride. I can do the same exact thing. I can create a variable called RGB which equals now pooling. I want to pool, what were my arguments? The image and the XY. And I should probably call this like max pooling, but whatever. Cat, oh, no, no, I'm not pooling the cat. The cat was filtered with convolution, and then the filtered image is pooled. So I'm pooling filtered at this given x, y. Then I need to figure out where am I putting the resulting RGB values. I'm putting them in the image called pooled, but that image has the dimensions of half. So the pooled x is x divided by the stride. The pooled y is y divided by the stride. And then the index is, so this is why this function really needs the image uh, passed with it. I, I should not have used the global variable. That was a terrible idea because I want to reuse it, but I have a different resolution of image. So I'm going to go back to making this image. And then uh, where did I call it? Here it's uh, image.width. I need it here, image. Anywhere else? Oh, here, image. So now I can say index of pixel x, pixel y in the pooled image because I want to say pooled dot pixels pix plus zero equals rgb dot r. And I need to add the load pixels and update pixels. And now this should be the max pooling operation. Go over the filtered image by the stride for every 2 by 2 area, find the highest RGB values, and then add those to the pixel, the corresponding pixel in the lower resolution pooled image. Let me make the height of my canvas times 2 so I can put the pooled image at the bottom right. So the filtered image went off to the right, and now the pooled image should go also off to the right. And let's give this a try. <laughs> I don't see the pooled image! This should be a G. I forgot to add the alpha in again. I always forget this. So I need to give it the alpha. There we go. So let's go back to a known filter instead of having random filters. So that was my edge detection. And you can see this is just, I mean, visually what I'm seeing right now is kind of like a lower resolution version of what you have above. But if I were to rewrite this with, say, average pooling, I think you would see it different. It wouldn't come at the, those features, these edge features that it's, you know, in a neural network would be discovering. Here I'm telling it to look for those are highlighted even more than they would be with just average pooling itself.
So now that I've shown you the code for both applying a convolution filter to an image and then a pooling algorithm to that image with a variable stride, I think that I can now go back and look at the larger, the larger diagram of the full story of a convolutional neural network that has these components in it. And again, our reference point is this diagram from the 1998 paper, Gradient-Based Learning Applied to Document Recognition. I also want to highlight for you a blog post that was really helpful for me when I was reading up and researching and trying to learn about convolutional neural networks. Um, it's this blog post right here, An Intuitive Explanation of Convolutional Neural Networks from, from 2016. Um, this diagram is super helpful. This is exactly what I want to talk through, basically. And there are a lot of nice visual diagrams and animations of the convolution process, uh, convolutional filters, as well as the max pooling algorithm itself as well. Here's my best attempt now at the full story of the convolutional neural network. We start with an image. The first layer is a convolutional layer. And I'm writing 2D because a lot of times in a machine learning library, you can have convolutions in different dimensions. And we're working with a two-dimensional convolution here. The convolutional layer has a number of filters. The image is sent to every one of those filters, and the, the filters are applied. I should say that the pixel, the values that come out of the filters aren't just the raw values from the convolution process. They're also then passed through an activation function, the same kind of activation function that's in a standard layer or a dense layer. So typically, um, this would be rectified linear unit, R-E-L-U. The next step is max pooling. I'll represent that with little squares. So the image that comes out of the convolution and the activation function is then max pooled. And then the output there is another image. So we take this first image, pass it through a bunch of filters, max pool them, and a whole bunch of other images that, if I'm using a stride of two, now have half the resolution as the original image. So the question becomes, what to do next? <laughs> well, we could be done and pass this to what, I'm, what is the last layer. And if we're doing that, at some point, the data does have to be flattened. So everything I did in my previous video about ML5 neural network with an image that just go, gets flattened and passed in, that is what happens in the last layer. The last dense layer takes these images and makes and has um, a hidden layer of neurons, and each image is flattened and sent into all of those and then sent to the output layer and passed through the softmax activation function that I've described, which gives it a probability for a classification, if this were a classification problem. But what's interesting is, in most cases, if you look at a lot of these diagrams, for example, this diagram on the blog post I referred to, or this particular diagram here, you'll see convolutions subsampling. Convolutions subsampling. Let me redraw this to give myself a little bit of room. I'm, I'm running out of room and I want to diagram the full story. I used so much space here for this image. So here's the same diagram, but squashed a little bit to the left because I want to add another convolutional layer and another max pooling layer. So I'm going to add some more filters here. But something interesting is going to happen here. So let me actually do fewer filters in this next layer. And I'm going to be really, I'm going to just only use two. I'm going to like get really, and there's only two filters here. Well, these images that result from the first convolutional max pooling process, they need to be tested, or not tested, they need to be sent to both filters. So this image goes here, this image goes here. So in essence, we have. One, two, three, four times two, um, times two filters. And I, I'm not really drawing this well, to have eight in total. So we get eight new outputs out of this convolutional layer, and each one of those needs to be max pooled. So now I have eight images. And remember, let's say this was 28 by 28. 
these are all seven by, oh, sorry, 14 by 14. Then after this convolution process and this max pooling, these are all now seven by seven. So we get these progressively lower and lower resolution uh, feature maps of the original image with lots of different filters applied in lots of different ways. And then the final result is essentially everything that I did in my non-convolutional neural network with an image, just that one hidden layer, it's called a fully connected or dense layer, and one output layer, all of that gets put right here. But instead of some original image being flattened and sent to it, this whole process has happened, and we're sending the data from these seven by seven images through the one dense layer, and one, and I've totally run out of room here, so I'm just gonna put O here, output layer. And this is where we would finally see, is it a cat or is it a dog? We would see probability values for the particular classification task. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oops, I'm missing one here. Even though this is a bit of a mess, uh, let me go back and refer to the, and thank the author of this blog post for this much uh, more, more uh, thoughtful and um, precise diagram showing these different layers, how the images uh, become lower and lower resolution, uh, become these final feature maps, and then get passed through what's here is actually two fully connected layers. So there are a lot of reasons why you might have different numbers of convolutional layers, different numbers of fully connected layers, different strides, different filter sizes. By the way, another word for filter is kernel. So this is, this, I really, all I wanted to do in this video was talk through all of the pieces, as well as show you some code that actually runs through and does those processes to an image itself, which I think opens up a lot of interesting possibilities for you if you wanted to create a project around visualizing the process of a convolutional neural network as it's learning. Now this would be a much bigger endeavor than what I've done here because you need to create these visuals out of all of the pieces as the training process is happening. But ultimately, what I want to do next is two slash three things. And it might take a while for me to get to them, but they will be eventually, hopefully, in subsequent videos. One is I want to just create this exact architecture with ML5. So I want to show you how in ML5 I can make ML5 neural network with a convolutional layer, maybe two convolutional layers, and then a dense layer and an output layer. Then I can take that and apply it to the previous example where I didn't use convolutional layers and just see how that looks. I would also like to look at something uh, that we could call a doodle classifier. So using the quick draw data set that I've referred to in a number of different videos, could I train an, a classifier to recognize particular drawings? And in fact, ML5 has built into it a, a, a pre-trained doodle classification model um, that's uh, pretty robust. So you know, I might try to train a sort of like smaller version of that, write all the code for that with ML5, but ultimately then show you how to use the pre-trained model that's in ML5 as well. But that uses convolutional layers. OK, so thank you so much if you somehow made it all the way to the end of this rather long explanation and kind of tinkering around with code demonstration of what the process of convolution and pooling is in a convolutional neural network. I hope to see you in a future Coding Train video. I mean, I don't really see you, but I, I feel your presence somehow. And sometimes you write a nice comment, it brings me a little happiness to my day. So I will see you in that virtual way in a future video. And thanks for watching, and have a great day that's not convoluted at all. <laughs> Goodbye.